New to Java and just starting out? Then you'll be curious to know the most common compilation errors that beginners have, which we'll uncover on today's episode. Java is Java. Now, before we get started, if you're completely new to Java and you haven't yet grabbed your Java Beginner Starter Kit, go over to our website at javaeasily.com and grab it there. It's a super helpful guide to help you get up and running with Java. It's completely free and it'll help you get set up with Java coding today. Anyway, let's jump into the episode now. So this episode is about the most common compilation errors that you get in Java as a beginner. And probably the best place to start in this episode is to understand basically what a compilation error is. So you have two types of errors in general. You can have compile time errors and you can have runtime errors. Now runtime errors are those which occur at runtime. In other words, these occur actually once your application is actually running. And usually these are errors such as, for example, logical errors where you've made some kind of programming error, or you might have like data issues or data consistency issues, that kind of thing through threading. Those are all runtime type errors. So those happen kind of like further down the programming lifecycle, if you like, once you've actually, you know, written our code, compiled it, packaged it all up, and it's actually running in a proper environment. So yeah, those are runtime errors. Whereas compilation errors or compile time errors, those actually happen at compile time. In other words, when you actually compile your code. So this is really the first type of error you tend to encounter as a Java beginner, because the first thing you do is you write your source code in the IDE, and then you try and compile the source code, or you try and build it, or what will probably happen instead, in fact, is actually the IDE will let you know that the source code isn't compilable in the first place because it will give you little squiggly red underlines and that kind of thing. But the main point here is the fact that compile time errors are pretty much the first type of errors you can encounter as a Java beginner. So that's what we're going to look at in this episode, and specifically the most common compilation errors that you can encounter as a beginner. So what can the compiler throw at you then? When you actually compile source code for the first time, you know, what kind of issues can the compiler come up with? So the first one you can look at or you can consider is what I like to call like a source file or a folder mismatch. So basically in Java, we have this convention whereby the name of the source file, that is the name of the file that contains your program code. So this could be, for example, person.java. The name of that needs to be the exact same name used in the class itself, just without the .java suffix. So for example, if you have a Java source file, which is person dot java then you would expect inside that source file to have public class person and those names in other words the name inside the class file itself inside that source file where it says public class person and the name on the file name itself person.java, those two things need to match exactly. And when we say match exactly, we mean they need to be, you know, letter for letter, the exact same. So in other words, the same case, you know, where you use a capital in the file name, you use the same capital when you declare the class and that kind of thing. So that's not too difficult to comprehend. There's a few other conventions we have as well while we're on the topic. And these are the fact that we have no spaces in the file name. We also don't start with a number. We never start with a number. So in general, just make sure that your classes are alphabetical. So they just use alphabetical characters. So it to Z or to Z, and they can use numbers, but the numbers need to come after the first character. But as a general rule, don't use numbers, as in don't use actual digits. If you need to refer to something, or rather refer to an actual number, then you can just write the number down, like instead of writing the digit 2, you could just write TWO, for example. Now, another convention we have as well in Java, it's not just about the fact that the source file name also needs to match the class name, of course, without the .java suffix. It's not just that, um, and that we also name those sensibly. In other words, no spaces, just stick to alphanumeric characters, that kind of thing, no funny symbols. It's not just that, but we also have a convention as regards the package structure as well. So where we have a package in Java, in other words, where you have a package statement at the top of the Java source file, like for example, um, package com.java easily, for example, what actually needs to happen behind the scenes is that there needs to be a corresponding folder structure which corresponds to that package name. And so this means that if you have a package like com.java easily, Therefore, what you need to have is you need to have a folder called com, and inside that folder, you have another folder called Java Easily, and inside that Java Easily folder, that's where your actual class file would reside. So if we go back to our person.java example again, if we have a package statement at the top saying package com.java easily, and that's where we declare this class person, then that means we need to have a folder com, Inside the folder com, we have the folder Java easily. And inside the folder Java easily, we need to have the actual source file, which will be called person.java. So that's something to watch out for. Now, IDEs actually solve this for you. So you don't actually have to, these days, go handcrafting, um, you know, the folder structure to make sure it corresponds with the package structure. When I first started out learning Java, in fact, at university, we actually had to do that by hand. It was extremely tedious, but as I say, IDEs take care of that for you now. Um, so you don't have to worry about that, which is good news. 
Okay, so that brings us on to the second thing then. The second thing we've kind of touched upon before, but it's about the conventions we use with case. In other words, the usage of uppercase and lowercase letters, so case conventions, if you like. So we've said that classes in Java, they need to be in what's known as title case. That means that any word that's in the class itself needs to start with a capital letter and all other letters are lowercase. So in the personal example, this is easy, capital P and the rest of the letters are in lowercase. So E-R-S-O-N in lowercase. If we had, let's say a class, which is, oh yeah, linked list class, for example, in java.util. So a linked list, you'll notice has two capital L's, capital L, and then for the first part of the class name linked, and another capital L there for the second part of the class name list, so linked list. So wherever you have kind of like unique words, if you like, inside the name of a class, they need to start with a capital. Okay, so that's the first thing. Other thing is that the variables and methods, those are the names that you use to refer to variables and the method names that you give in your classes, they need to be in what's known as lower camel case. Lower camel case basically means that um, where camel case comes from is kind of like if you visualize the humps of a camel, then a hump would be a capital letter and the dips between the humps, I guess, um, would be the lowercase letters. So camel case, you can sort of imagine that it's a mix of like uppercase letters, but mainly lowercase letters, and then an uppercase letter, then lowercase letters and that kind of thing. So if we considered our linked list example again, where we've got a capital L, for the word linked, a capital L for the word list. If that was converted to what's known as lower camel case, then the first capital L would be a lowercase l. So basically what lower camel case means is that it's the same case convention we use, that is combination of capitals and lowercase letters as we use for Java class names, apart from the fact that just make sure that the first letter of that is in lowercase. That's what lower camel case means. And all of this kind of stuff, you've probably seen this before, but maybe you haven't come across these terms um, such as title case or lower camel case. So that's probably the only new thing that's going to be here for you right now. Now, in general, method names are in lower camel case, except a special method, and that's the method which is a constructor in the class or any constructors you've got in the class. So, for example, in, you know, our person class, which starts with a capital P, when we give the name of the class person, the capital P, um, the constructor also needs to be the identical same name for that as well. So you'd have public and then again, capital P, then lowercase e-r-s-o-n. Yep, that is right. <laughs> and then curly braces and then whatever the implementation is inside that constructor. So those are the only special cases really where we deviate from this lower camel case naming convention. Okay, so that's number two, case conventions. So we've covered really, if you think about it, the structural and convention issues. Um, now we can kind of think about things that might be missing when we're going about our programming tasks. And these are generally about missing syntax. So this is number three now where we have like missing semicolons. If you come from a JavaScript background or a background in other programming languages, for example, Visual Basic or that kind of thing, then what you'll see is that those languages in general tend to use line breaks. That is the fact that a statement is on like a new line um, they use those line breaks to denote the fact that we've got a new statement. And so because of this, that's why you don't need to explicitly put some kind of statement terminator or statement delimiter, if you like, inside your code. Now, Java is different. We need to have these. So we need to put a semicolon whenever we've finished a statement. OK, and um, I guess the reason for that is because in theory, you can have like multiple statements on the same line. You don't tend to have that, um, but you can do that. Um, and there is a case of that, for example, in a for loop. So when you're in a for loop, the three constituent parts of a for loop actually are individual statements in and of themselves. So then that's why you have the semicolon there. And you can imagine if you tried to break up the first line of a for loop across multiple lines, it wouldn't look very good. So we always need to remember to include semicolons when we end statements in Java. Again, thinking about missing things or things that can be missing in syntax, sometimes we just miss the return statement out. So if you have a method that returns something, sometimes we're focusing you know, so much on the syntax itself and we're kind of in that zone of just thinking about what the method's actually going to do. Um, and we're thinking at that kind of level of abstraction that we kind of forget the higher level purpose of the fact that, oh yeah, this method is also supposed to return a value out as well. So when writing a method, always make sure that you've got return statements as well. It's just something that's kind of easy to, to miss off when you're really in the zone of working on a particularly intricate or tricky method. Another one, nice and simple to comprehend, is missing parentheses. So parentheses are the, the brackets, kind of um, not the curly brackets, but the curved brackets that you see, which are usually above the keys nine and zero on a keyboard. And you know, in simple expressions, it's usually fine. You don't forget to include the parentheses. Um, but in complex expressions, sometimes you can't quite see them because there's so many kind of, you know, parentheses, ending stuff here and, you know, beginning stuff there and all the sub expressions and everything that you just can't quite see them. Um, so that can happen. 
And it also happens as well to professionals when you're refactoring sometimes. If you have to refactor by hand, sometimes it's possible that we can you know, miss off a bracket or something or a parenthesis and we're kind of like, you know, where, where is that kind of thing? So don't worry about that, but you do have to watch out for these kind of things. Now a bonus one, because it's not just about keeping to the structure and the coding conventions and that kind of thing. Sometimes you can actually have mismatches, okay? You can have mismatches of curly braces. So in Java, you have these curly braces, which we know about, which can define a block of code. And you usually have these, in fact, you're obliged to use these, where, for example, you're um, defining a block, you know, an implementation associated with a while statement, for example, or a for loop like we touched upon before, or um, as part of a conditional, you know, with if and else, you have these curly braces to delimit the if section or the else section, that kind of thing. And sometimes when you're refactoring code, it's possible that you can kind of forget to bring across a particular closing curly brace or something like that. You know, again, this usually happens when we're doing things by hand. And then if you have a particularly long method, which you shouldn't in general in Java, you should have small short methods, which are very concise. And then it makes it easier to, to be able to see these kind of things like things missing and everything. And it's very apparent then. But if you don't do that and you're working on legacy code and you have like a huge method and you want to kind of like, you're in the stages of tidying it up, then sometimes it's possible that you can kind of lose off a curly brace. Um, and then it can be difficult Difficult to see where that is. Thankfully, IDEs in general will um, show you pretty much where it should be kind of obvious, in other words, where the mismatch occurs. And if not, an IDE will normally give you the ability to jump from one bracket or from one curly brace to its matching counterpart. So for example, if you're on an opening closing brace, you know, and you give a particular key combination, then it'll jump to the closing curly brace that it thinks is the um, is the one that matches it. And vice versa, if you're on the closing curly brace, you can press the key combination to get to the opening curly brace. Now that's useful, but what's more useful is the fact that we in general have the convention that whenever we're opening or rather nesting a block inside another block, we indent by particular tab position. And so that means that you can visually kind of match up the opening braces in one section with the closing braces in another section. It's not as much as if you actually put the, the opening braces at the beginning of the next line, which is popular, for example, in C++. But in Java, just by convention, we don't do that. So we have it kind of the opening brace is always going to be at the end of the line that opens that block. So it's not as easy to see, but like I say, we can use the tools in the ID to be able to see and figure out which um, curly braces are uh, mismatched and then obviously fix it. So yeah, professionals can have this too um, and it can happen. And um, sometimes it can be nice, in fact, when you're using version control tools, if you're completely you know, down a rabbit hole of like refactoring, you can basically do a diff with the last version that you had and then it will just show you the bits that changed. And then oftentimes that can be quite kind of apparent then to say, oh yeah, it's this particular you know, um, bracket that I'm missing here or whatever. And you can do that either through the Git history, if you're using Git as a version control tool, which is the most popular version control system used today. Um, but you can also do it if you use the local history feature of IntelliJ IDEA, for example, um, which is incredibly useful, by the way, if you haven't used local history in IntelliJ IDEA, I'd recommend having, having a look at that because every time you make an edit on your source code, um, IDEA pretty much will record that edit and it will enable you to go back in time and see all the changes that you've made, which is very useful. Right, that was a lot to take in and we saw different classes of issues that beginners can have and hopefully it gave you a good appreciation and awareness of things to look out for in the future. Anyway, that's it from me now. So until next time, happy coding and speak soon. Bye.